right. So, Comoricon 2022 has come and gone. And so now is as good a time as any for me to do a, a, a con report on my thoughts on the convention for this year, particularly since this is my first time as a panelist, as a person actually giving a panel, a panel in this case on um, collecting anime soundtracks on vinyl. Full title is Anime at 33 and a third RPM, collecting anime soundtracks on vinyl. On vinyl? Nah, not final. Um, and so, first off, what this meant is that I did not get to go to to opening ceremonies because I was busy going to the panelist meeting and learning the stuff I needed to get set up to do my panel properly in terms of video cables, what, what's, what the rooms are set up for in terms of cable standards and all that sort of fun stuff, um, pre-panel setup, um, what they need to get from the programming office before the start of the panel, all that fun stuff. Um, and it was a very, very straightforward and painless process. Um, like my panel was strictly PowerPoint slide slides, um, with images, no audio, no video, any of that sort of, as far like video files or any of that sort of video clips or any of that sort of stuff. So that made setting up the, that made a lot of the panel set up stuff pretty straightforward and uneventful. It like, I was able to use a Chromebook for doing my panel set up uh, with a USB C to HDMI adapter that did the job perfectly. Um, in terms of projectors and all that sort of stuff. The panel itself, um, if you're following my social media or pay attention to the blog, that went up on, or that was on uh, Saturday, the second day of the convention at 1.30. And I had a really good turnout. And now I had prizes that I gave out and did a drawing, but I didn't advertise that I was doing a drawing. Um, I just got a really good set show up. Um, and while the actual panel presentation part went under the one hour I was um, allocated. It's all, that's also fine because I got one night to do a drawing and so I need to have time for that. But also like one of the things you worry about in anime conventions is the questions is um, what type and what quality of questions are you going to get from your audience? And I did have a bit of a dread of that. But I, the questions I got were good questions. Um, some of them were on stuff that also that I had considered including in the pa in the actual uh, panel deck, but I decided not to just for time reasons. And ultimately, I think would have been worth including. Um, particularly, people asked about it, so that's a something I will do. Um, I'm also planning to do some tweaks to this and panel and do it as a video as a video as well for those who weren't able to go to Comoricon or who did go to Comoricon and had went, wanted to go to other panels that were opposite mine. I do realize this does somewhat undercut my pitch for doing the panel next year if I were to do so, but that's okay. Honestly, um, this is a kind of evergreen concept that works well for not in terms of a video, but it, it's evergreen, but also it doesn't have the same degree of evolution necessarily. Uh, the background content is still going to be the same. The types of, the, the recommendations for what to look for in a term table is generally going to be the same, unless for some reason, for example, the price of making uh, turn tables with optical audio output goes way the hell down. Um, that like that part's going to be the same. That part doesn't need to change much. The only part that's going to really evolve in the panel might be the, um, the U.S. record label and storefront kind of thing, and other, and even then, not much. So that's something I can do a video out of, and I intend to do a video out of. Uh, the rest of the convention, um, AMV contest was great uh, this year. AMV contest has always been good at Kimura Con. It's one of those things where like I see stuff for 
AMV contests at other conventions and their big lineups and that sort of thing. And I'm certain that they are have a great number of competitors as well. But like some of the big ones that do well at Otakon and MA Week in Atlanta and SakuraCon and that sort of thing, they get submitted here at KimuraCon too. And usually they make it in the running. Plus we get some other stuff. So it's it's one of the things where like it's a good solid and like the AMV scene in general has like always been great. I feel uh, has always done well, and KimuraCon always does a pretty good job of putting stuff together and coming up with some interesting categories. This year they brought the uh, retro AMV category back. It's, that's one I love a lot. I do think that a, more, a few of this panel of the uh, AMVs they used felt a little too recent. Like, there's a chunk of me that's, when I think retro anime for an AMV contest, I my, my brain goes pre-2000, or at least, um, yeah, like like pre-2000. Like, when we, we have that almost, um, uh, I'd say about 60 years of anime history at this point. Um, seven, 60, 70 years, depending on like exact start air dates for Astro Boy and when it's like seriously started going. Uh, so as far as televised animation, anime, not just anime, like short films, like, um, the, uh, Noble Warriors of um, crap, I forgot the Japanese name for Peach Boy, um, but yeah, um, that one. So, so like when I think in retro anime, I'm like, oh, I, I my brain goes fifty, like my brain goes sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, Uh the stuff that was air, like specifically, the stuff that was um, before I started, like, the stuff before I started watching anime, and the stuff that was airing when I started anime. However, I also realized I'm in my 30s, and so there's some fans who are like, "Oh, I'm 20 now," um, and I'm so their their retro association is the stuff that they, of course, when they started watching anime, so the 2000s, maybe the 2010s. I think 2010s is pushing it too far, but in any case. Um, it was a good selection, a good lineup there for what we had. And related to the AMVs, we also had a documentary that was screening, um, Synced Together, uh, which is a documentary about AMVs and the people who make them. It's been screened at a whole bunch of other conventions. It's not available for uh, digital distribution or physical release as yet. However, having watched the documentary, I enjoyed it immensely. It does have the um, we're all getting along together uh, vibe that you get with other documentaries about Circles of Phantom. And honestly, that's fine. That is legitimately fine with me. Um, a documentary like this is not meant to necessarily... Like, is not necessarily meant to be a work that is digging up the dirty laundry of a scene. Uh, but like, normally when you get that sort of thing, it is often in the case done in the instance of a scene that is coming to a conclusion or a scene that has... I'm not going to say... like hit the mainstream, but a scene that a, a, a scene that is not niche, necessarily. You, you Something like, for example, I mean, yes, you can argue, oh, a bunch of dirty laundry aired in the uh, Rise and Fall of Western Civilization series of documentaries with um, the punk scene and the heavy metal scene and that sort of thing. I'm also not a fan of those documentaries. To be blunt, um, there's a good line that uh, 
in, that in the making of documentaries about or making a documentary about uh, Evangelion 4.0 that comes from uh, Hideki Anno talking about documentaries that there is a degree of editorial impact on the documentary in terms of you ultimately making the decision of what you keep and what you cut uh, and what you cut and what you choose to film in the first place to determine what the voice of your documentary is going to be. And when it comes to fandom documentaries, the, the vibe I've noticed is that people inside the scene tend to be more complimentary or tend to be more favorable in their presentation because they are people who are making a movie, a documentary about the thing they love to show why they love it. And from an outside perspective, in this documentary filmmaker coming from a purely outside perspective, they're more likely to show the dirty laundry, but in some cases in the process, they're also more likely to, not always, but sometimes, omit the, the reason to omit the reasons why people like the thing in the first place. An outsider documentary is more likely to. I've, I've encountered when it comes to a niche fandom situation feels like they will they are more likely to get into a case of I came into this not knowing why people like this thing and so when I and in the process of making this documentary they don't necessarily know what to look for to show why people like the thing and instead look for the thing that oh that makes the good story which means we need a hero and a villain and which means they tend to magnetize towards scene drama. And Synced Together is definitely of the, this is a documentary made by people who are into this medium, the artistic medium of anime music videos. And indeed it is its own separate, a um, separate artistic medium born out of remix culture. And getting into that. It is, and it's a well-done documentary. I'm not going to get too much into it since I can't point you to where you can get it or anything like that, and I would like you to appreciate it on merits. The filmmakers who made this were also some of the guests of the convention, and they did do a fair amount of work, uh, or do a fair amount of programming, in addition to the documentary related to AMV. Some of this was 20-year anniversary of KimuraCon stuff. Here's past years of AMV contest winners and that sort of thing. But we also got like a really good panel on Sunday, which is basically just, here's a bunch of AMVs from across the history. It was mixed, I would say. Like there was some good stuff there in terms of like historically important stuff. I would have liked to include that there for them to have included like some of the historically significant documentary or uh, AMVs in terms of development of the medium that got mentioned in the documentary as well. They didn't include a couple of them. They did um, the first known AMV, which is a darkly comic video of a whole bunch um, using footage from Final Yamato of a whole bunch of characters getting murked, all set to All You Need Is Love by the Beatles, which, well done. I was list I was in the panel room a bunch of younger fans in there, and it's still killed. Even in the context of it being a, a digital rip from a several generation old VHS tape that was in turn taken from a VHS tape, not from film. So, you know, not and possibly even with the source material for that original VHS tape coming from a, a multi generation VHS tape. Because this is very old school anime fandom. And we had another one, I guess like not quite the second OV, second AMB, but a, a later one that was um, another comedic one using uh, the song, the title song from Hair, um, showcasing the Bishoujo art, not just the Bishoujo, but Bishoujo and Bishonen art style of the. 70s and 80s and 90s and that sort of thing and 
Like those are a couple good ones. There are a few other ones that I wish they'd done as well. Like there is the uh, AMV for um, which is uh, an it was a lip sync video. It was one of the earliest lip sync videos with footage of Evangelion set to Angle, which one of the things that came up on the documentary was, oh, this was done on a, another VHS edit, which is impressive, considering it's a lip sync video. And that would have been a really great one to include as well. And I'm disappointed they didn't do that. I'm disappointed they didn't do um, Tainted Donuts, the uh, Spike and... Uh, or the, the sort of fanfic video of Spike versus Vash the Stampede, kind of the quintessential um, glimpse of this chunk of the 90s anime scene. But otherwise, wonderfully done. Other panels I went to, uh, I didn't get to go as much to the Guest of Honor panels um, in terms of the expert guests as I'd like. A lot of their stuff was scheduled opposite of my things or other major panels. Um, several members of, of Studio Trigger were there for, and they did do their Geek Boat panel, which I went to. And for those who are unfamiliar with that, is this is basically, this isn't like the official Studio Trigger news panel, uh, an announcements panel or sneak peeks of their show, of their projects. This is the members of Studio Trigger, like uh, Wakabayashi and Koyama Hangout, Crack jokes, doodle, do sorts of other stuff. And that's what they did there. Um, Koyama was doing doodles on uh, sticky notes. I'm not going to show them, any of them, because they, they specifically asked, hey, don't post this on social media. We don't want to get in trouble. We want to keep doing this at future ones. But they did car uh, caricatures of people in the audience and other anime characters and comics characters. Um... A few people in the anime industry of a couple very high profile directors, two of whom have projects coming out recently in their major franchises. Not just major franchise. I'll just say one who's come out of retirement again. Technically again again. And one who is probably going to retire once this project is done, once he's done putting together this bunch of compilation films related to this other TV series that's based off of the big Mecha franchise that he created. I'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to say I gave it away, but I hopefully gave you enough of a hint. That was really fun. Um, other fun panel I went to, I wasn't able to go to the Anime Jeopardy panel that I went to the previous, like I went last year. I did the thing to audition last year and me on the panel played and got second place. I'll that actually that's last year's um, Anime Jeopardy is on YouTube. I will put the link to that video in the show notes if you want to see my performance. Um, but I did this year go to Anime Celebrity Jeopardy with three of the guests of honor, um, one of the founders of T Tonari Animation, um, along with um, one of our cultural guests of honor, Zach Davidson, and one of our cos one of the cosplay guests of honor, Queen D, who does basically cosplay and organizes and runs cosplay burlesque. And this panel, this competition, was pure chaos incarnate. Um, in the in a very fun way. Um, I would the comparison I would make as someone who doesn't listen to as many panels or watch as many panel shows as I'd like, but is a good big fan of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. I would compare this if you did the episode of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me with Mo Rocca, Paula Poundstone, and Maeve Higgins as your panel with with, with, with a selection of news stories that gives, May, uh, gives Paula Poundstone plenty of her, wait, why the hell is this science research being done in the first place? Is that, that like, 
Hagon energy and Mo Rocca with his full, I'm going, I think, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but I'm not entirely sure. So I'm going to stammer and, and stall for time and play things out for a bit um, to try and guess the, to give myself time to figure out the answer. And um, Babe Higgins' decree of, I didn't do the research. I didn't do the readings. I didn't bother to do the readings. I can't be asked to do the readings. And so I didn't do the readings and my score reflects this, but I'm going to be a pure chaos goblin in the hallway energy. Um, in particular, like depending on the, like, like on the score results, while the um, head of a uh, Tenari animation, I'll just say he got Maeve Higgins usual score. The, the, the lack of knowledge plus like the, the active lack of knowledge plus um the Paula um I actually do know some of this stuff but I am incredibly indignant about particular degrees of the nonsense nonsense in, that is involved here as well um definitely went to Queen D in all the to be clear to be clear to, to uh, Queen D in all the best ways. Like that was a comedically joyous experience. And I am very glad I went to that panel. I was very glad that I took the time to go to that as opposed to going to the dark horse comics panel or that sort of thing. So that was, that was fun. I am glad I went there. That was kind of my, kind of my, uh, like between the, the, my panel and the, AMV documentary. That was kind of my Saturday. I did kind of go to the, I did kind of go to the 20th anniversary of Kimura Khan, um, history of the convention and AMVs, history of the AMV contest through past winners panel. Just, and that was like first thing in the morning. That was like, that was a fun little, okay, I'm just gonna go to this, ease in, relax. Once I've finished this panel, I'll go grab some lunch. When I was watching this, grab, you know, go grab some lunch and go sit up for my panel. Now, that, that was how things went for me, and it went very well. Today, I did get to go to one of the uh, the academic track panels, so to speak. Uh, in this case, with Elisa Friedman, who was here last year. And last year, I went to her panel on emoji. And this year, I went to her panel on... Um, Successful mistakes in Japanese popular culture in various forms. Um, it didn't necessarily go as much into mistakes necessarily, just um, things that I call it almost things of cases of things failing forward or people redoing, uh, taking concepts and reinterpreting them in different ways. In the sense, like for example, of um, cup noodles being born out of Americans failing to properly understand the instructions and manner in which you are supposed to heat up a packet of package of ramen um, and just breaking them up and sticking them in a cup with some boiling water. And basically the um, people who started cup, who, the inventor of cup noodles going, Oh, okay. So they're doing this, huh? Um, sure. I guess let's find a way to do Let's find a way to, um, make a product out of this since clearly there's some appeal to this concept, that sort of thing on like that sort of stuff. But it, was, it was a fun panel. Uh, if you have an opportunity to go to a convention that she's at and she gives this panel, um, or any of her panels is worth definitely worth attending, but this did get what felt to me like a moment of great praise where after the panel, I had chatted with her for a bit. I mentioned, and she saw my badge like, oh, um, like she basically kind of recognized what panel that mine was, um, and said, oh yeah, you were going to do the vinyl, vinyl, you did the MA vinyl panel. I would have liked to have gone to, or I mentioned, oh, I didn't, no, it was, I, I mentioned I didn't get a chance to go to her panel earlier because it was scheduled opposite mine. And I mentioned it was the anime on vinyl panel. So, and she said, oh, I would have liked to have gone to that. So that, that made me very happy. 
um, in terms of not the sense like of, of her in particular, but having one of the academic guests felt that my concept wasn't interesting and engaging enough that they wanted to go to see my panel. So that was also really good. I got her contact. I will be sending her a copy of the slide deck. Um, yeah, that was good. Um, I do need to talk a little bit about uh, there's a degree of drama. On the There's always kind of Trump, some degree of drama backstage, and we had some here. Um, what kind of came out over the social media and that sort of thing. Of Kamorakan. Is. So what happened is. Last year. You know, two big things. Three big things. First. There were some significant hiccups regarding. Like, Kamorakan decided that they were going to. Require. Still require. Uh, proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test and also require max masking. And later on, like, somewhat later in, in the thing, but not too much later, going, oh, and we want it to be, we're going to require N95 or KN95 masks. I'm fine with that. I have plenty of those available. I've gotten some for my last job also because I have family members who have family members going through chemo and was immunocompromised, so I wanted to be just doing that anyway for being out in public. But there's apparently some pushback from staff and some people resigned. Um, then, on the last day of the convention, we had, so it, Comoricon staff issued a statement regarding an incident last year where a volunteer on staff was, had refused to check, to sell memberships to Asian Americans. I caught a little bit of a rumor of the, a wind of that and that, oh, more I was investigating and the seller was like a particular volunteer and this person was probably like not going to be minimum, not going to be put in a volunteer, like accepted for volunteer next year, possibly even kicked out of the convention, like banned, banned from the convention. Um, my anticipation was, oh, a lot of this is going to be a, to an extent, like the heavy reaction kind of thing in terms of how Comorcom was going to bring down the hammer was going to be a stuff happening behind the scenes kind of thing. Um, they probably issue a statement at some point. I like, we did issue like a brief statement, um, that, hey, we're investigating this and we will take appropriate action kind of thing. I believe they did that, they gave a brief statement of that last year. Um, this year, they issued a formal apology statement um, saying, hey, there was an incident that happened last year and actually, I think, let me pull this back up. I don't think they even mentioned there was an incident last year. Yes, there was. But the incident last year should have happened. Like, and due to miscommunication, how the situation was handled, it made a group of attendees discriminated against, feel discriminated against. We take full responsibility. Um, they, they, they don't accept racism. Um, and the staff, they've implemented racial sensitivity training, all this, that, and the other. Th um, and all this, and all, basically saying, hey, we, we, have, we have taken steps to rectify the issue. That sort of thing. But it was otherwise fairly vague about the particulars of it just, hey, a thing happened last year. There was a screw up. Like that, that like, it's, it was screwed up that this happened at all. We're taking steps to rectify we're we taking steps to rectify it and enumerated the steps. But they didn't specify what the issue was, just oh, bad thing happened last year. Otherwise vague and non specific messaging. This, in turn, led to another statement being issued, more or less, that was last night, like basically this afternoon, almost right before the start of closing ceremonies. And 
and as a consequence of this with the announcement um we got like the second announcement basically ended up being oh now a whole bunch of our like executive staff like um like the chair of the convention and some of the staff and attendee services executive executives have just stepped down from the have, um stepped down to how this was hand, how it handles but possibly also because of the message like the messaging on this and With like the, the head scratching moment for me being like the messaging on this, like there were some missteps a little bit in terms of they they were announcing things that were completed that weren't quite done yet, which okay, that's a hiccup, but that's a hiccup. Um, That's a, like, that doesn't, like, and the best thing is that the incident from last year, from all the information I've come, I've gotten on this from various sources has been that it's happened and Asian American attendees were discriminated against or, or by some portion of of physical registration staff um, for th um, the convention. But like Tomorrow County staff recognized there's a problem and are trying to fix it. And like, they so having it having like the, that much of a I mean, how to put this? I understand like, there is a thing in fandom circles, and not just fandom circles, but in terms of when dealing with management of an event or that sort of thing. But when you get into nonprofit stuff or fandom stuff where it feels like there's an impulse to have to where, okay, the solution is whoever's in charge, whoever's in charge at the top right now just needs to fall on their sword. Um, you're the chair of the convention. Okay. You fall on your sword. And I, uh, I think that that is not always the right option. Um, to have the reflex be, in, I mean, it, this is like fall on your sword in addition to taking steps to rectify the issue. Because if the person who is resigning who is, or being pushed to resign is a person who is actively engaged and work and wishes to work to rectify the issue and is taking the right steps. Um, and which is something of the case here and with the error being not that they weren't taking the right steps, but more that the communication about the steps being done was incorrect and incomplete makes me like the worry that the, 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 the worry I have for this reflex and this isn't just a convention drama thing or it isn't just a convention thing it isn't just a fandom thing this is a thing that happens in all fields um, in in professional organizations and nonprofits and that sort of thing my my worry about this reflex is it creates a situation where by doing this reflex of oh I we're going to our 
uh, executives in position in these positions where they're responsible for these programs or for the fix um, because they made an error or be, because they because this they slipped up uh, or or because they slipped up and did not implement the fix fast enough or it was communicated that the fix was implemented when it was still in progress it ends up creating a situation that delays the implementation of the fix that now we are in a place where in where Comoricon staff now has to replace in addition to implementing these new programs and protocols and training and that sort of thing for upcoming staff they are now also in a situation where they have to implement all this stuff plus they have to fight replace the positions of the people responsible for implementing all this stuff and onboard those people into these programs and what's to what has been done and what has been done and what is we're waiting to be done in the meantime. And that's that creates a situation where whatever the resolution that Gamorkan is going for is that resolution could end up unintentionally being half-assed because the people who would be implementing this fix are being dropped in halfway through with one person having been a whole bunch of stuff and then a whole bu and then with it being left incomplete and the new staff being half where to pick up the pieces with the catch being that the people who that the people who left it incomplete didn't leave it in incomplete because they didn't want to see it finished. It, it wasn't because they necessarily threw a temper tantrum or something like that, basically information available, but because the people at the top determined, oh, we have to we have to show that we're serious about this. We're gonna show we're serious by axing pe by axing people in charge of things. Like, there's a reason why you sometimes have people in mental magic positions or something like that. Um, like, there was like the, the responsible, but like, I feel like the better choice for this was if you know who was the person who did this, just ban them from the convention for good. Say, like, oh, it was this asshole. Or assholes who were not were refusing to sign up Asian American people for memberships. We have authority information of who this is, or we have who the who their direct management of this area was at that time. Those people get sacked, and the people running the convention continue to put together a process to keep this from happening next time. Um, if this is a case where you had a recurring pattern of conduct where the fix isn't actually doing it, then that's a situation there. Okay. Ax the person. Um, but this like ax, ax the chair, ax the head of attendee services, whatever. But starting From starting, starting everything over from scratch in terms of the people responsible for implementing the program makes me worry that it's not, that it's, whatever this implementation is, isn't going to be done well. I realize that I'm not one of the people who was harmed by this process, but unless the people who were direct, who were, unless the chair of Kimura Khan was refusing to recognize the issue unless the head of attendee services um or was refusing the issue i mean it sounds like that to a certain degree the staff and attendee services team may have been part of the problem going over the notes here but not and
I don't know, but but the, the chair, uh, them plus the chair. Um, unless the chair was part of staff and attendee services at that time, it, it, it feels off to me. It feels like, again, like my, my, my worry for a case like this is, I mean, this is me coming from the IT side of things, where I've run into situations where there has been attempted implementation of projects and protocols and procedures um, where sometimes what has happened is people in authority positions have changed midstream. Um, I mean, I've been in a situation where my last job was doing IT support and help desk support, not my, not my immediate last job, but the job before that was in a position where I was supporting a major pet hospital chain. And we were in the middle of rolling out um, new technology and um, and some new stuff for the in terms of medical record tracking and that sort of thing at a practice wide level. When the management of the parent company decided, okay, we're going to completely scrap, like we're going to. Where a merger happened, the old IT head staff happened um, was dumped, and in the process, they also decided we're going to change IT service companies from the one I worked for for a different company while still doing the migration, and that that worried me. While, uh, while we were doing migration, that was in process. That that was it. Was situation where like I'm my my pets don't go to that cert that didn't go to that chain before that that major pet hospital chain before and I was when my response my reaction afterwards was I wouldn't want to go back to the chain after because this situ this decision because of changing horses in the stream in this manner was more likely to lead to a shit show. And we're also like what's lingering in the back of my mind is while all this is going on, we have the nonsense going on on Twitter. Again, look at my, the IT part of my brain going. We have a change in management and everything below it getting ripped up and thrown out and that sort of thing leading to a situation where Twitter doesn't have a security team anymore. Not Twitter doesn't have a moderation team. Twitter doesn't have a security team. And as of this recording, Twitter doesn't have a security team anymore. It doesn't have anyone responsible for making sure that the, you know, people don't hack the payment system that's being used to pay for that blue check mark. That sort of thing. And so this isn't necessary. Like, this is a much smaller scope than either of those. In the case of the pet hospital issue, this isn't a case where lives lie in the balance for this upgrade for this transition. But my worry is when any whenever you're trying to implement any sort of new policy, is if you dump your management or the people in charge of, of the thing. Before you've even finished, it creates a situation where whatever your fix is, again, could get half-assed, or quarter-assed, and or full-assed, depending on how you consider the that 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 that's supposed analogy is supposed to work, and it becomes harder for whoever comes after to fix it. I'd feel better if this was a situation where. They implemented the fix, and then the old chair stepped down, like, or like, like, or like, the, the they still like can the uh, staff and attendee services team implemented the new policies and rolled those out with the new staff and attendee services team, and then the chair stepped down to let a new chair handle. 
the implement to well the implementation had been done to handle afterwards the follow up and any iterations and changes to the new policy that needed to be made. I guess is what I'm saying. Would I be the person to volunteer for doing this job? I got enough stuff like as a like I'm. I'm an IT person on the autism spectrum. I am not a person who is in the right. I'm not qualified. Is uh, what I'll say. I am not qualified to fix a company's a, to fix a nonprofit's HR protocols. I'm not the guy for this job. I'm not the guy to take up that job midstream. I'm not the guy to implement the modifications afterwards. Uh, Honestly, I like to, like, I think with where we're at now, next best thing would be Kamora Khan gets in, like, works with the port, with members of the Portland, a the Asian American Pacific Islander community who are into the convention, who are, who are attendees and bring them on board into more executive related positions um bring them onto the board possibly even as chair um or even not as a board but at least as part of somebody who is on the any position to develop the new property new policies um consider considering what's but what is done is done uh, with where we're at, that's I think is the next best step. Um, with where we're at now, so that's the good, that's the messy. I'm still going to go to Kamorakon next year because, as far as what's going on is concerned, um, I do appreciate that. Like when all is said and done, the we found out about like I found out about this as a follow-up to Kamorakon to what happened last year with Kamorakon saying, hey, we're we're working to fix this and we're trying to keep people keep you in the loop as opposed to Kamorakon going as opposed to the bad thing happening, Kamor saying, okay, this is a, this is a bad thing that happened and then never saying anything again ever. Which is a thing that lots of other gro- other groups have done instead. Even major corporations like, or moderate corp, geek adjacent corporations like White Wolf Entertainment and, by extension, Paradox Entertainment. So, yeah. That's where I'm at now. Um, did you go to Kimura Con? Oh, oh, another thing. Cosplay. I'm going to talk about cosplay real quick. In terms of what I saw for Hall cosplay. Um, Fair amount of Chainsaw Man. I don't just mean, and by Chainsaw Man, I don't just mean um, Denji. I mean Chainsaw Man. I mean full-on helmet with the Chainsaw thing in front, with the arm pieces, the whole thing. Full-on Chainsaw Man costumes. All of them also generally with the white shirt, with the uh, white button-up shirt with the blood splatter too. Um, Multiple people. I was very impressed by in a definite sense of like, oh, wait, we, you know, chance, you know, I feel like Chainsaw Man is big when people go, when you have multiple people for the hall cosplay, not the on stage, co- not for the cosplay contest cosplay, going of hard mode or or beast mode as the case may be, demon mode as the case may be in this one. Um, fair amount of Final Fantasy VII. There, there's always Final Fantasy VII, but I'll big chunk this year um a lot of maids as usual lots of genshin impact lots and lots of genshin impact i'm surprised by the quantity of genshin impact present at the convention this oh actually not really that surprised about the quantity of genshin impact uh not a lot of fate or fate grand order characters this year no sabers no uh lancers nothing like that i usually see in the past i've seen like a couple of them but i feel like a lot of the fate energy 
has been picked up as far as from for as far as gotcha games are concerned by by Genshin Impact. Um couple birdie ring like I saw a, a birdie wing cosplayer. Um mainly the character from the first season. Uh, the name just drops out of my head. The one who has the scar on her face and the what's revealed to be prosthetic arm. Um one cosplayer as her, who I saw on Friday in a crosswalk, so I wasn't able to take a picture at the time. Uh, few per, uh, a few Persona cosplayers, Persona 5 and Persona 3, uh, which I was pleased to see. Um, not so much Persona 4. And at... Also, the the, one, the ones that were surprised to not see any of. Uh, occasionally, you see some characters from currently airing sh like shows, not like currently airing original shows, or recently airing in a little bit past original shows. Like, if you look at some of the video from the World Cosplay Summit, you have cosplayers in the competition as characters from like Horus Recoil, which was air actively airing at the time. Uh, here, um, no like Horus Recoil, no uh, Gundam uh, Witch from Mercury. I expected to see a Sul I expected to see a Suleta Mercury. I expected to see at least a couple Suletas. Um, are like Choo Choo, like maybe, but probably like Choo Choo feels like a more of a next year character. Just because of the hair. Um, the hair seems involved enough for Choo Choo that that might be something where oh, where a currently airing show wouldn't necessarily have enough time. Whereas Suleta's hairstyle is standard enough that there might actually be a, like a, a, you might actually be able to have, have a wig that you've already made that fits that hairstyle and it's just a matter of putting together the um that Suleta's un school uniform as the bride or groom in this case. Uh, so I was expected to see a Suleta Mercury. I also know Akiba made war oinky doink maids. Um especially considering the considering the oinky doink maid um cafe is like it's a pretty standard maid uniform maid cafe uniform just with the pig ears. And there is, I believe, a pig neck ornament, pig snout neck ornament. Um, but not a lot of that. Uh, maybe next year we might see some Akiba Made War. I'd like to see some Akiba Made War costumes in the, uh, the future. I'd love to, to see some uh, the Chorus Recoil costumes in the future. So that covers my Kimura Khan 2022 reactions. Again, I will be going next year. I don't know yet if I'll be doing a panel again. Um, I had a good experience this year. Um, I don't want to necessarily want to do the same panel I did this year next year. Uh, but I don't know what my next panel would be yet. Uh, might do something born out of the anime appendix and concept, but I'm not sure how that would play out. That's, that's something I have to think about over the year, over the upcoming year, but that's where I'm at. So if you, did you go to Kimura Con? If so, post in the comments about your experiences and, um, we'll return to our regular scheduled stuff or our, our normal stuff next week. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 